Thank you, Lord. Okay, so this was last week, what were spiritual disciplines? And basically it's practices we do regularly that can help us change with the power and grace of the Holy Spirit, our sinful habits into good habits that make us more like Christ and connect us closer to God. So those are the spiritual disciplines. Today I wanna to talk about spiritual practice and practice basically means the actual application or use of an idea, belief or method. So someone can know all the spiritual disciplines and even teach somebody the spiritual disciplines, but if they're not practicing them, they're not gonna benefit from them. So there's one thing to know the disciplines and it's another thing to actually put them into practice and apply them to our lives. Practicing spiritual discipline is not easy. So that's the first thing you have to realize so that you don't become hard on yourself. It's not easy. Jesus reminded disciples that believers will experience persecution. He said, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. And anything you try to do in the beginning is difficult. And that's why they call it practice or discipline. You know, if you decide to go to the gym and start working out, it's going to be hard in the beginning until you get used to it. You know, so it's not going to be easy because a lot of people give up, you know, quick if it's not easy. So it's going to be difficult. Look at what it says here. Spiritual disciplines prepare us for difficult moments of persecution, temptation, doubt, and grief. Now I underline the word, two words, prepare us. So these disciplines will not exempt you from difficult moments, from persecution, from temptation, doubt, grief. In other words, we're all still going to have problems. But as you apply these spiritual disciplines in your life, they're going to prepare us to handle these difficult situations so that you can overcome those problems and the temptation, the doubt, and the grief. So these things, these are things that we all experience as human beings. It's part of being a human being. So the disciplines prepare you, praying, fasting, you know, being in the scriptures, it prepares you so that when those tough times come, and they will come, when you feel like giving up or, or hell breaks loose, you know, you have problems in your family, with, with your spouse, with your kids, then you go to work and there's problems there. And then you go, you know, you get a flat tire. Everything seems to happen at once. These disciplines will prepare you to have the character to be able to endure and not end up basically cursing somebody out or doing anything like that. So that's why these disciplines are important it prepares us, it makes us more like Christ. Spiritual discipline helps us deepen our relationship with God. So as you practice these disciplines, which we're not gonna get into today, we're just talking about the practice of it. And I'm gonna give you eight things to consider when you're practicing these things, but it will deepen your relationship with God. You're gonna get closer to God. A preacher once said, if you feel far away from God, guess who moved? And we're the ones that move. God never moves. He stays in the same spot. So if we feel far from God, it's because we move. But as you practice these spiritual disciplines, you're going to get closer to God. The Bible says, come near to God and he will come near to us. God does not wish a shallow, good morning, see you later type of relationship. You know, just real shallow, superficial. Lord, I'm praying that you protect me when I'm going to work. And that's it. In Jesus name. And you just go to work and you go about your day without contemplating and thinking about the Lord all day. He doesn't want a shallow relationship. And none of us, you know, humanly speaking, you know, for those of us who are married, we don't want a shallow relationship with our spouse that all we do is good morning and, and to bed at night and that's it. And there's no real interaction. There's no real fellowship. God wants a deep relationship. God wishes to be in a deep, satisfying, loving, transforming and challenging relationship with us. So God desires to get closer to us, but we have to take the first step with these spiritual disciplines. God already did everything he needed to do for us to have a, a deep relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. There's nothing else that God can do for him, him to draw closer to us. It's in our court. We have to draw closer to him. Spiritual disciplines built, us, built in us the attitudes, emotions, thoughts, and actions that will promote the kind of relationship that our hearts yearn for. So these disciplines will build that, your attitude. Because like John Maxwell says, your attitude will determine your altitude. In other words, your attitude determines how high you're going to go with God, how far God's going to take you, 
how deep you're going to experience the presence of God. It's all about attitude. You know, you know, people that are sometimes they go to job interview, they're overly qualified. But if they have a bad attitude, the employee employee is going to dismiss them and say, well, you know, we're looking at other people. But what broke the deal was the attitude. So as we practice these spiritual disciplines, you're going to have the attitude of Christ. Your emotions are going to change. Your thought patterns. Some of us, you know, have... Uh, emotions that have been traumatized because of things that happened to us in our past we have walls around our emotions we don't let anybody in which is good in a way because no one can hurt us but it's bad in a way because no one can help us either so it's a two-edged sword no one can hurt us but no one can help us and we don't really get to appreciate who you really are because you're hiding between those walls because emotions have been damaged and it doesn't matter how old you are if you don't allow God to deal with damaged emotions and trauma that happened, maybe in your childhood or a breakup with a boyfriend or girlfriend or something traumatic that happened to you, if you have not dealt with that, that is still there. Time does not heal a wounds. God heals wounds. It's only God that can begin to bring that healing process. And as you do these disciplines, the emotions are going to get restored. They're going to be healed. And we all know people that are up and down. When they're feeling good, they, 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 they high, you know, spiritually, they want to do this, they want to do that. But the next day you might meet them and they don't want to live anymore. And then the following day you might bump into them again and they're feeling good and they want to do great things for God. And, you know, so God wants our emotions to be stabilized. You know, God has given us emotions. He's not against emotions. Those are feelings. But he is against emotionalism. And that's how some Christians live. They, they give into emotionalism based on how they feel. That's how they act. And we're not supposed to be acting based upon what we feel or what we know is true. And your thoughts are going to change your actions and it's going to promote the kind of relationship that our heart yearns for. Now, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 5 through 8, the apostle Peter here gives us things that we need to add to our faith. Now, we add these things to our faith, not for salvation, but for sanctification. There's nothing that you can add to your faith for you to be saved if you repented of your sins and if you ask Jesus to come into your life and you turn your life over to God and you say, Lord, I'm tired of doing things my way. Take control over my life. I want to serve you, Lord. You're saved by the grace of God. But here Peter acknowledges that, okay, you're saved by grace, but there's other things that you can add to your faith so that God can bring transformation and so that we can be productive Christians. Listen to what he says. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Then listen to the passage. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance or endurance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love and then it goes on to say for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our lord jesus christ so we add these qualities that the apostle peter mentioned so that we could be effective and productive in our knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ in other words so that we can grow spiritually we all know Christians that have been saved for many, many years, and there's no growth. They're not living an effective Christian life. They're not living a productive Christian life because they lack these qualities. So Peter's saying, look, add to your faith these qualities, and you see that you're going to be effective and productive in, your knowledge, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to grow. So the apostle Peter is clear. God has given us all we need, and we must make every effort to grow. Just like when we were kids, you know, we grew into adolescent and then adulthood, the same thing it is spiritually. There's different levels of, of growth spiritually. You know, you're a baby Christian when you first get saved, when you first receive Christ into your life, you're an infant, and then you go into adolescent, and then you go into maturity as you learn and you add these qualities to your life, you're beginning to grow. So you could be 70 years old, and if you just got saved, that person is still a baby Christian. Just because they're 70 years old, that doesn't mean that they know the ways of the Lord or that they mature spiritually. 
you know, it's a whole different thing being mature uh, in the natural and being mature spiritually. God is looking for, you know, spiritual maturity. So number one, when we practicing the, these habits, know your bad habits. Pray that God will help you see the specific areas of your life that need changing. So you're going to be praying, Lord, if you don't know your bad habits already, ask your spouse or someone that's close to you. They'll let you know real quick what are your bad habits you know, that need to change, you know? So pray, God, show me specific areas in my life that I, I continue to do these things by second nature that need to change. And pray that God will give you the courage, the strength, and help to face those areas. Now, that's important because many of us, a lot of painful things happen to us in our past while we were growing up. And sometimes we don't like to talk about those things, which means they're still sensitive. And that's why we don't like to talk about them because they still, there's a wound there. You know, you're still nursing those wounds and they're never going to get healed. So ask God to give you the strength to begin to deal with those areas and face those areas in your life that you never face. Maybe insecurity, maybe low self-esteem, maybe you abuse, you know, physically, emotionally, verbally, sexually, whatever the case may be, ask God to help you to face those areas. You don't want to keep sweeping them under the rug because they're never going to go away. They're always going to be there. So ask God for help, especially when you start implementing these uh, spiritual uh, disciplines. God, give me, give me the help that I need. I want to change. Number two, confess. Confess your weakness to God with a humble and hopeful heart. Now, God already knows your weakness. But when you confess it to God, you're acknowledging that he knows your weakness. So it's not like you're going to surprise God. You know, if you have a bad temper and you say, Lord, I confess I have a bad temper. God is not going to say, wow, that was interesting. I never knew that. Thank you for sharing with me. You know, he already knows your weakness. But when you confess it, you're acknowledging it. You, you, you're confronting it yourself. So confessing your weakness to God is more for you to acknowledge that you need help. You're humbling yourself before God with a hopeful heart that he's going to change you. You know, we always want to confess our weaknesses and our, and our sins to God immediately. You don't want to wait. And number three, submit to God's call to change. Surrender your efforts and receive God's grace. In other words, you're not going to change on your own. That's why it says surrender your efforts. If you could change yourself by yourself, you would have changed a long time ago. You, we can't do it on our own. And that's why Christ came to die on the cross. Paul the apostle said this. That if we can be made right with God, we, then Christ, if we can be made right with God by ourselves, then Christ died in vain. Another translation says Christ died for nothing. If we could change ourselves and make ourselves better and, and remove sin from our lives whenever we willfully choose to, then Christ died in vain. The reason he died on the cross is because we could not change ourselves. Sin was too powerful. You know, the bad habits were so entrenched in our lives that we needed a savior. And that's what he is. He's the savior. That's why his name Jesus in the Greek is Jehovah's salvation. So his name actually implies what he came to do. So every time you say Jesus, what you're basically saying is Jehovah or God is salvation. He came to save us from our sins. So you don't change on your own. You receive God's grace. Trust that God is with you and will help you. Trust in God. Now, I'm not saying that you don't make any effort to put these practice, but you don't, you know, try to make it on your own. You depend completely upon the Holy Spirit. As soon as you get up in the morning, God, help me with these spiritual disciplines, Lord. Help me read the Bible for 15 minutes. Help me pray, Lord, for 10 minutes. Help me implement these principles. I depend upon your grace. I've tried to do this on my own, and I couldn't do it. It didn't work. I need you, Lord. When you humble yourself before God like that, the Holy Spirit will help you. And a lot of times it's just basically our pride that does not allow God to help us because we're so prideful and we're used to doing things on our own and we're independent and we don't need anybody. And the whole, you know, individualistic, you know, culture of, of, uh, in America that we don't need help from anybody. We can do it on our own. And when we humble ourselves before God and we acknowledge, God, I need your grace. I need you to help me. I can't do it on my own. The Bible says that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up in due time, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. 
another uh, scripture in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says this, cast all your anxiety upon the Lord and pray about everything. Cast all your worries upon the Lord. Another translation. So everything you, you cast upon the Lord, recognizing that I can't do this on my own, Lord. I need your help. Number four, be accountable. Find one or more people you trust and ask them to pray with and for you about a specific area in life that needs changing. In other words, a mature believer, not just you know an infant Christian, a mature believer that you can say, I'm struggling with this. I need help in this area. I'm, I'm really stubborn or you know, there's still sexual lust in my life, or, you know, I get angry easily, you know, and I start cursing. Call somebody and connect with someone that is more mature than you, that's been walking with the Lord longer than you, that have dealt with those things already, that they're a little further in their walk with God so that they can help you and hold you accountable and pray with you. We need one another's help. You can't do it on your own. And God has put the church there so that we can help one another and be accountable. Allow them to be God's instruments in your life for specific areas. The Bible says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you can be healed. And that's important. It doesn't say so that you can be forgiven, but so that you can be healed. Because a lot of times, all we need to do to heal from damage, emotions, and pain and all that is just to confess not only to God, but to another brother, if you're a man or a woman, if you're a woman, you confess them and say, Lord, look, I'm struggling with this. And as soon as you bring it into the light, the power of darkness is broken over your life. So Satan works in darkness. He operates in secrecy. So if you stay with that as a secret, you're going to stay sick. But if you confess your sins to one another, you will be healed. And that's talking more, you know, healing emotionally of those things that you still struggle with. You need somebody else to confess. Things that you probably never told anybody. You know, if, if you're a, a woman, find a sister that's mature than you and say, look, this is what went on when I was young or this is what I'm struggling with. And you see that there's gonna be healing in that and you're gonna become better. So it's important to be accountable to one another. So it's not just a vertical relationship with God, just me and God and that's it. God also wants us to have a horizontal relationship with our brothers and sisters. And that's why the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. So you just can't love God and hate everybody else and not be connected to anybody else. You love the Lord your God and you love your neighbor as yourself, which God knows that we need accountability and we need people to come around us, especially if you're going to start implementing these spiritual disciplines you we need help number five train to substitute a bad habit with sin with a good habit virtue if prayer is difficult for you find a person who will pray with you or begin a prayer group that meets once a week and i know bridget has a prayer group on thursday at 7 30 if you have a difficult time praying the best way to learn how to pray is to attend a prayer meeting that's how i learned how to pray listening to these giants of faith that you know i considered when I first got saved, you know, they used to pray and, and, and be led by the spirit in prayer and all that. And me being around that atmosphere, I caught the spirit of prayer. And all of a sudden, I was leading out in prayer. I was moving in the spirit when it came to prayer. So connect with people that pray so that you can learn how to pray and, and to help you and to support you. And the prayer meeting is great for that. You know, start leading our prayer little by little. Just be around that atmosphere. There's power in prayer. So sometimes you can't do it alone. You got to connect to a, a prayer group or find a person that will pray with you, maybe one-on-one -on -one over the phone. And, and that helps a lot. Number six, be persistent. This is extremely important. Bad habits take a long time to form. It takes an equally long time to break them and acquire new habits. In other words, don't beat yourself up because you were doing good for five days, and then the sixth day, you didn't practice the discipline of praying and reading the Bible. And now the seventh day, you wake up and you're upset that you can't believe you did this. You know, what's the matter with you? Be persistent. You fall, you get back up. The Bible says the righteous person falls seven times and gets back up. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, after eight times, he won't get back up. The point is that he continues to get back up regardless of how many times he falls or he messes up. You stick with it. You be persistent. 
And that's not only applicable to spiritual things in anything. If you're going to start learning, you know, to, to, to go to the gym and work out, anybody wants to play sports, basketball, if they're not persistent and continue to do what they uh, want to do, they're not going to grow and they're not going to mature. And bad habits, we all know that sinful habits, it took a long time to form. You know, some people have been gossiping for 40 years. That's not going to go away in a week. It's going to take time for you to acquire new habits. So be persistent. Number seven, be graceful toward yourself and others. It's possible you'll experience failure. Remember, you're not changing just for your sake. You're allowing God's spirit to work in your life. You will experience failure. Not one of us is perfect. The only Jesus was perfect. He prayed 100% of the time. He knew the word 100%. He was the only one that was perfect. So don't set up these standards in your life that are impossible. Take baby steps. You're going to fail. You know, you're going to mess up when you're first starting these spiritual uh, disciplines. But you know what? The next day, you pick it up again. You know, if you say, you know, I'm going to read the Bible 10 minutes a day, and you do that consistently, and one day you don't, don't beat yourself over the head and, you know, and don't allow the enemy to, because Satan comes and starts accusing you and condemning you, what kind of Christian you are, what's the matter with you, look, you, you're not good enough, and you can't do this, it's just too difficult. There's grace that God gives us to continue to practice these things, so be grateful toward yourself and others, those who are learning how to Put these spiritual uh, disciplines, you know, into practice. Be graceful towards yourself. Now, it doesn't mean that you make excuses for yourself. It's different that, you know, people that make excuses, I can, it's impossible. And, that, you know, any excuse they find, you know, this is more for people that are hard on themselves, you know, that expect perfection from themselves and expect that they'll never fail. That's unrealistic. The Bible says we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, you know, you're going to mess up. So don't beat yourself over the head. Jesus gave his life for you. You are that valuable. God will, be, God will patiently wait for you to get up and continue walking every time you stumble and fall. Now, that's important because when you fall, God doesn't say, okay, you know, that's your problem. Now, you know, I don't, I don't want you serving me anymore. You messed up too many times. I'm tired of you, you know, with the same thing over and over again. God waits patiently for you to get up and continue walking with him every time you stumble and fall. God's not going to beat you up. He knows our humanity. He knows our frailties. He knows that, you know, we're, we're sinful creatures saved by grace. God is extremely patient. He's not like people. He's patient. You mess up. You don't meet one of these spiritual disciplines. You get back up and you continue going on the same direction. You never give up. You never quit. Do not obsess over the actual change. It's not your job. The Holy Spirit is the one who renews and transforms us. So don't obsess with, I got to change this. I got to change that. It's not your job to change yourself. And remember, you can't change yourself. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit to bring transformation. And like I always tell new believers, I said, because they always think I got to stop doing this. I got to stop doing that. I can't do this. I can't do that. And I always tell them, it's not what you have to stop doing, it's what you have to start doing. If you start doing these spiritual disciplines, your life will begin to change. Because some people just focus on the negative. I got to stop doing all these things. I want you to focus on the positive and say, no, I got to start doing these things. And as you do these spiritual disciplines, you're going to see that your life is going to begin to change because it's the Holy Spirit changing you. So don't obsess about the actual change and be hard on yourself and, and trying to do it on your own is the power of the Holy Spirit. And like I tell people, when I got saved, I never said, you know what? I got to stop cursing. Maybe that's a bad habit. I read the word of God so much that within three months, I read the whole Bible. Remember, prior to that, I was ignorant of the Bible. I didn't know any story. Jesus walks on water, you know, Genesis, nothing. 18 years ignorant. I didn't even know one scripture, not even John 3, 16. So when I got saved, I, got, I was so hungry for the word of God that I started in Genesis and went right through. And in three months, I completed the whole Bible. And after that, my language began to change. My speech began to change. And even unsaved friends were telling me, Peter, your speech is different. You know, what's going on? You know, and that was because I got so much of the word in me that the cursing stopped automatically. Because remember what Jesus said, 
whatever the mouth is full of, that's whatever the heart is full of, that's what the mouth is going to speak. Another translation says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you fill your heart with the word of God and with scripture, you're going to start speaking the word of God. You're going to start confessing the scriptures. So I never actually sat down and said, you know what? I got to stop these things. So even though I needed to stop certain behaviors, but I never sat down and consciously thought about that. I got a hold of the word of God, attended prayer meetings on Tuesday. Thursday, I was in the youth group. Friday, we have fellowship, home groups. And Sunday, I was in church. I started doing all those things. And gradually, the Holy Spirit started bringing the transformation that I didn't even notice. Unsafe friends began to notice. And that's what I mean. You surrender to the Holy Spirit. So don't focus on, I have to stop doing ABC. Focus on, I have to start doing these things. And as I do these spiritual disciplines, the Holy Spirit is going to transform my life, not me. Very important. Focus on the growing relationship with God. Let God be God and do what he does best. Give you a new life. So focus on that, on your relationship with God, getting closer to God. And as you get closer to God, all these sins that are tripping you up, you know, the, the negative attitude, all these bad habits from the past, if you continue to pursue a relationship with God, all those things are going to begin to be broken out of your life just by going after God. Because a lot of people, unfortunately, they think, well, when I get my life cleaned up first, then I'll start going to church. Then I'll go, you know, and start serving God. But the thing is that you can never clean up your life. You know, so that's a wrong way of thinking, even for unbelievers, when they think that way. You can't clean up your life. And that's why Jesus died on the cross, because he's the one that cleans up our life. If we can clean up our life, like the Apostle Paul said, then Christ died for nothing. The cross is crucial to transformation process in our life. Without the cross and the resurrection of Christ, Paul the Apostle said, we are still in our sins and we are to all people the most miserable. So let God be God and let him change you. You know, like a preacher used to say, you know, when I was young, he used to say, let go and let God. Let go and let God. Let go of those habits and let God operate in your life. And number eight, be grateful for all the things you already are and have. Thank God for every small change that occurs, you know, and you'll see small changes. You know, you might not notice it, but other people might notice. And that's why it's important to be involved in fellowship. It's just like when you're growing up, when you were, when we were young. You know, you go visit an aunt or uncle and different family members and what they tell you, oh, you've gotten so big. And in your mind, I don't know what you're talking about because we don't notice the gradual change. But people that haven't seen us in a long time, they notice the gradual change. So the same thing, God will begin to make small changes in your life. Thank God for them. Thank God for every time you get up after you fall. You know, you don't, you miss one of these disciplines. Thank God that he's going to pick you up in his grace and that you're going to move forward and that you're not going to give up. And thank the people around you for helping you along. And I emphasize this all the time. You need the church. You need other believers, people around you. Listen, when I got saved, I thank God that I got saved. I, and my pastor was a godly man, you know, which I still meet with him on Thursdays. He have a pastor's group. But they were strong men of God in that church that loved the Lord, that fasted, that prayed, you know. Great examples, you know, married men with their wives and, and their kids and all that. You know, I had that exemplified for me. You know, there were not there was not one divorce in our church back home in Brooklyn. You know, everybody stood with their spouse, and it was just a great atmosphere to grow up in because my father never taught me what it means to be a father or man. I had to learn that from my pastor, you know, and I thank God for them, you know, and you gotta thank God for the people around you that are helping you along the way. You cannot do it alone. And I owe a lot to my pastor and all the elders that, you know, were in the church, you know, in, in Resurrection in Brooklyn, you know, the leadership there and everyone there. It takes a whole church to, to build somebody up and to encourage somebody up and to lift somebody up. I remember, you know, when I was young Christian working in the church office, a woman used to see me all the time and she always say, how, how are you doing, you mighty man of God? You know, and I was young and those words used to stick to my heart, you know, that she saw me like that, you know. Because when you're young, you don't think about those things. But she was always encouraging and speaking that into my life, you know, and I thank God for her, you know, and others that spoke into my life. We need 
people around us to help us. I know some of us don't like help from people. We need help. And I want to end this uh, section with this quote by John. It says, a disciplined person is someone who can do the right thing at the right time in the right way with the right spirit. I love that last part with the right spirit. So a person can do the right thing at the right time in the right way, but with the wrong spirit. So doing the right thing with the wrong spirit becomes the wrong thing. It's always based upon our attitude, our motives. We got to have a right spirit. So again, a disciplined person is someone who can do the right thing at the right time in the right way and with the right spirit. And we're going to end there and then open it up for questions and comments.